Thank you so much, singers, for introducing us in the atmosphere of the high season of the birth of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Decoration Committee, for bringing out these beautiful uh, ornaments that make this season special. And thank you so much, adventurers. Thank you so much for bringing out the jewels of this church. May the good Lord bless this ministry abundantly. Yes. The presence of our children on our stage this Sabbath morning kind of introduces us into the atmosphere of our message. My title is Don't Stick the Stick to the Fence. I did have a stick. Somebody took it from me. Oh, it's there. Sorry. I don't know if you know what that saying means. Don't stick the stick through the fence. It does exist in some languages, not in English. The expression to stick the stick through the fence means to vex, to anger, to aggravate to exasperate somebody, to mess with somebody's head. That's what it means. And it comes from a situation where you can imagine yourself having a stick and a dog. You know dogs usually like sticks. If you throw the stick away, most dogs would be happy to go and get it for you, bring it back. But you can imagine a situation where you are outside of a fence and inside there is a dog. You know the dog is sleeping, but for some reason, hard to understand, you want to mess with the dog. So what would you do? You stick the stick through the fence. The dog would notice it, become alert. And uh, because you agitate the stick, the dog would start barking. But then you move down a few pickets, and there you stick in the stick again. What will the dog do? follow you, and bark. Then you move a few more packets, stick it in, what will the dog do? Follow you, and bark. And then you leave, and you are at a distance now, but you can still hear the dog doing what? Barking. So the stick is not there anymore, but the dog is still barking. So then, sometime later, you're passing by again, you know the dog is there, and you stick it in, the reaction will be the same, you do the same process, and then you leave, and you can hear what? Still barking. And then, you go, you stick it in, And what does the dog do? Barks. Then you pull it out, throw it away, and you walk the opposite direction. What will you be still able to hear? The dog will still run down the fence and do the barking. And that's the expression from which in some languages, you have the meaning to vex, 
to anger, to aggravate, to exasperate someone. And that saying in that context is not about sticking the stick inside the fangs to aggravate a dog. It is among human beings. Now, I know what I described here can, uh, in some people's mind, be something that is tantamount to animal abuse. And I'm not encouraging anybody to do that. I'm describing a situation to create a picture in our minds. A picture that has to do with the message that I'm bringing to you from the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians... After the Apostle Paul speaks about how important it is to walk, to walk in Jesus Christ. And there are several expressions that the Apostle uses, walk in the good works God prepared in advance, walk in the truth as it is in Jesus, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, Walk in love, walk circumspectly, walk carefully as wise. After all these expressions, the Apostle Paul is dealing with three distorted, dysfunctional, and thereby difficult relationships among people in the church. One relationship is wives and husbands. The other one is children and parents. We've spoken about wives and husbands before. We are focusing on children and parents now. And then slaves and master, that is going to be next. What is interesting about all three of these relationships is that there are some aspects in their dynamics that are distorted, dysfunctional, that are difficult. And the main issue, the way the Apostle Paul deals with them, is abuse of authority, abuse of power. Actually, this is the process the Apostle Paul goes through. In all three cases, he first speaks about the distorted behavior of the one that is suspected or is accused, rightly so, of being disrespectful toward authority. We already saw that uh, the issue with regard to wives, husbands, relationship was some wives took the liberty probably because the gospel, they said, to disrespect their husbands, even publicly. And the Apostle Paul says, no, 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 that's not good. But then he moves down a little bit and deals not only with the crown, he deals with the roots. Usually when authority is involved... What those do wrong, that are supposed to submit to the authority, authority as being legit or not, it doesn't really matter in this context, the behavior, the distorted behavior, the dysfunctional deeds of those that are supposed to submit to authority are more visible than the distorted and dysfunctional works of the authority. But the Apostle Paul sees a relationship between the two, like the relationship between the crown of a tree and the roots of the tree. The Apostle Paul says, yes, there are some issues here. This is not good. It's not good for wives to disrespect their husbands. No, it's not good. But let me move down a little bit. And then he gives a lengthy sermon to the husbands. Telling them, hey, guys, problem is, instead of you being the servant leaders of your wives, the loving mashal that you should be to them, 
And instead of emulating the love of Jesus Christ, the Savior, to them, you've become domineering and imposing, and that's not good. Love them the way Jesus loves the church, and then you may see a change in attitude. No guarantee. Please understand. If somebody believes just because one changes, the roots, the roots are, in this context, many times those things are not visible because they are under the disguise of authority. But uh, just because one party changes the attitude, it's not a guarantee that the attitude will change on the other side as well. And I'm emphasizing this for a reason. For instance, in the context of marriage, sometimes people come uh, to the pastor and say, you know, pastor, I did this and this and this and this and this, and nothing changed. And it happens. No matter how you change, it may be that the other will not change. And yet, the Apostle Paul says, it's not fair to discuss only about this. We have to discuss about the roots as well. Because if you are domineering, if you are imposing to your wives, it may easily happen that they will not be able to take it and therefore they will act up and they will disrespect you. Now, that's wives and husbands. Now we are focusing on children and parents. Let's pray and jump in. Heavenly Father, we pray that your spirit will guide us. This is a touchy topic. And I pray that your spirit will lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. We are at the last chapter. Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Children says the Apostle Paul. Children. Who is children? Who are children? Well, children can be babies. They can be toddlers. They can be adventurers, pathfinders, teenagers. Are you a child? No matter your age. Because the word Paul is using there is not children as in designating a certain age bracket. It's children. And you can be a chi child no matter if uh, you know your parents or not. You can be a child no matter if you like them or not. No matter if they still live or not. Is children. In a way, I would risk say that even in a world where uh, you are now dealing with uh, in vitro fertilization and uh, sperm banks, that concept of, of children as uh, connected to the ancestors should have some sort of significance. The Apostle Paul says, children, children, no matter your age, children Obey your parents. And the word he's using there is very interesting. It's hypoakuo. And from akuo you have in English the word acoustics. Because the way this expression works, it's listening. But listening in a certain way that is listening Hypo, that is under, under listening. The word itself carries the idea that the child's attitude toward his or her parent, no matter the age, should be of a certain kind of listening. It's hypo akuo. He could have used the word akuo. No, he said hypo akuo, which means under listen. That is, they are at a certain level of authority, you are at another level of authority, lower, and you listen up. Your parents. Not your parents, really. 
Please notice the Apostle Paul says, children, listen or under listen, obey your parents in the Lord. This is not any kind of parents. And the, the way that expression is constructed there, it means parents in Lord. You know, we have this English expression, parents in law. We don't say parents in the law. We say parents in law. In the Greek text, that uh, definite article, the, is missing. So you can say, children, obey, under listen to your parents in Lord. Your parents in Lord. Because this is not limited only to biological parents that biologically gave birth to somebody. It also can refer to somebody that birthed somebody else spiritually. Yes, your parents in Lord. Why obey them? Why under listen to them? The argument is very tough. And to some of us, it's very difficult to swallow. Do that, why? Because it's right. Huh. And that same word, the root of the same word that is used there for, for this is right, is used by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 uh, 3.15, sorry, where the discussion is uh, between him and John the Baptist. You remember the story. He comes to John the Baptist and says, uh, please baptize me. And he says, no, 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 no. There's no way for me to do that. You should be baptizing me, right? And what does Jesus say? Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now. For thus it is what fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. All righteousness. And it's the same root because it's right. Let's do what is right. And after Paul says this, obey or under listen your parents in Lord because it is right, it is just, that's the correct thing to do. He quotes something from the Old Testament. Please tell me what he quotes. He quotes one of the commandments. Which one? How many yet? The fifth commandment. Because he says honor, which means to put price or value. Honor your father and mother, which is... The first commandment with promise. And then he details. Verse 3. Verse 3. That it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And this is a little different from what you can read in Exodus chapter 20 verse 12. He practically paraphrases the commandment. This is how the commandment goes. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long. That idea that it will be well with you, it's an extrapolation of the idea of uh, having long days. That your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And the Hebrew word kabed which means honor. It's very interesting because there is a, a, a play on words there. See, in Hebrew, you have two words. One is kaved, which means heavy. And the other one is kabed. If you look at two, those two words, you will see that the letter in the middle, one of them has a dot, the other one does not have a dot. And that's what makes the difference. But in Hebrew mind, honoring somebody is treating somebody with, so to speak, so to speak heaviness or load 
or weight. You should not treat somebody you honor with lightness. And here we have something that is ontological. Somebody may think, okay, what is that? Well, if you're a parent, you may be tempted to say, well, just because I'm a parent, just because I am his or her parent, he or she is supposed to under-listen to me, to obey me. Is that correct or not? Just because I'm the parent and he or she is the child. Is that correct or not? Well, please remember, Paul said, obey your parents in Lord. Because there might be situations when somebody obeying his or her parents would disobey the Lord. Does that make sense? So it's fair to say that the confusion probably comes from mistaking listening or under-listening to somebody or obeying somebody, mistaking it for honoring somebody. No. Honoring is ontological. It does not depend on the quality of the parent whether you should honor or not that parent. No matter who your parent is, if you know that parent, there might be a way for you to honor that parent. And I always admire people, especially when I see people treating their old age parents with honor. Because this is somehow almost against society today. Unfortunately, we are at a point where honoring our parents you may say, ah, well, uh, they have not been real parents to me. But that's not the discussion here. And please notice what Paul says in verse 3 there. Verse 3 says that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So you may ask, okay, so if somebody dies early, somebody dies of an early death, does that mean that uh, he or she died because didn't he or she didn't honor their parents? Not necessarily. There can be multiplicity of causes for an early death. But what the text says, that it may be well with you, it doesn't say it will be well with you, but it says it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. How does that apply? I would suggest one of the ways it can apply uh, it, it, uh, ways it can apply is this. If you honor your parents and your children honor you because they see how you honor your parents and they learn from you honoring your parents, you may get a better chance to a better treatment in your old age, and they will do all it takes for you to live longer. But you know, we are at a place in our society where very few children even get a chance to live in the same house with aging grandparents. And I don't want to be judgmental, that's not the point. My point is to raise awareness that we may have a problem here. I'm here to talk to you about how important it is to pass down honoring. Yes, there might be situations in which somebody may be better off in a place where people have specialized care in place. I don't know. I don't want to judge anybody. But don't we realize how important it is to learn and pass it on, this concept of honoring our parents? And the Apostle Paul is very honest, very, very frank, and says, yes, this honoring is crucial, it is important, and 
listening to them or under listening to them or obeying to them, that is an extra to those parents that are in the Lord. If you are a parent in Lord to somebody, biological or spiritual, then yes, it's a fair expectation for you to be listened to or even under listen to. But now the Apostle Paul moves forward, and as I said before, he always has two levels. He approaches the one that should be under authority, and in this case, we have a situation where this respect toward authority is ontological, means it's built into nature, because you are coming from your parents, some way, some sort. But then he moves to the roots. And this is what he speaks about in verse 4. And you fathers, let me specify something there. It's not fathers exclusively. You probably know, some of you know a little Spanish at least, and you know what padres means in Spanish. What does it mean? Fathers or, or parents. Mis padres is not just my fathers, even if I have more than one, say in some combined families, right? But padres can mean parents. So that's exactly how the Greek word there, fathers, that is parents, ancestors, do not provoke do not provoke your children to wrath. So now he is dealing with this part here. Do not provoke your children to, to wrath or anger. Don't anger them. Don't irritate them. Don't exasperate them. Or don't stick the stick through the fence. That's the point here. Don't provoke your children to, to wrath, but do what? But bring them up. And there the word is not necessarily bring somebody from here, here like this. The word is from ektrefo in Greek, and trophy means food in Greek. So the meaning of that term is Nourish them, nurture them, nurture them, nourish them, feed them into things, in the training or instruction and admonition of the Lord. Training and instruction seems to be when you teach your child, again, no matter what age the child is and no matter what your age is. But you teach a child how to proceed in certain situations. Admonition, on the other hand, seems to be when you have to intervene and correct something in the behavior of your child. The Greek word there is nuthesia, which means mind, knows, and put, place, or arrange. In other words, the Apostle Paul says, you have two aspects here that you want to combine. You want to combine training and you want to combine admonition. That is, you want to be able to get in the mind of your child. And when something goes wrong in the mind of your child, you want to be able to work from there. You want to be able to correct things in the mind of your child. This is beautiful because when I, when I recognized the word there was nourish and nurture, I remember probably the most famous word, Bible passage from the Old Testament that we quote. It was even quoted today. You probably remember. It's Proverbs 22, verse 6. And it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, 
he will not depart from it. The word is train, train up. But the Hebrew word there, chanak, has a very peculiar meaning. And I'm going to put on screen there a literal translation of that verse from the Hebrew. Uh, let me just give out uh, one little caveat here. Whenever you're interested in the literal meaning of a text, try and find a literal translation. There is the Young's literal translation. There is uh, Smith's literal translation. I'm ha having here a Bible verse from Smith's literal translation of the same verse, and this is what it says. Straighten to a youth upon the mouth of his way. Oh, mouth is mentioned there. I wonder why. Well, because Paul says nourish. Are you making the connection now? Paul says nourish the child. And uh, the wise from the Old Testament says, straighten to a youth upon the mouth of his way, and you may think, okay, what does that mean? Because the word straighten is an archaic word, and you're right, but this is what it means. For instance, this is something your child should be able to eat or swallow. Can he eat this the way it is? Well, if he has good teeth, if he is at that stage of development, yes. But it may be, because we all start in the same place, fortunately or unfortunately, it may be that your child is not able to handle this. So what you want to do is to straighten to the mouth of his way. Straighten meaning make it a little piece, a bite, something that can be handled, and you place it. Ah, that makes it different, doesn't it? Because that ties into what the apostle says, nourish, nurture the child. A child will not grow like this. Whoops. There you are. No, you are supposed to nurture it. And I want to be as honest as I can with regard to this. I am still at a stage where I probably look at these realities from the perspective of the child more than the perspective of, of the parent. And I know you can uh, use this against me possibly and say, Pastor, wait a few more years and then you will see how these things work. And I have to admit, I do not have the experience of some of you with regard to these deep things. But what I'm trying to do is to convey the biblical message as it is in the Bible text. And as I can perceive it after prayer and after trying to dig myself in it. Because I believe it is important to understand how nurturing, nourishing a child is crucial for his or her growth. Straighten to a youth upon the mouth of his way. Move it back a little bit to the NKJ, please. In the way he should go. Please notice that both translations say something that seems to be slightly or maybe even radically different from the way we used to interpret this passage. Most of the time when I'm hearing it quoted, the meaning of this Bible verse is this. I want to make sure I raise my child in a way that he or she will go on the way I'm going. Are you with me? On the way I'm going or on the way I envision or I dream for him or her. But the text does not say that. The text says in the way he should go. 
And then the other translation says, upon the mouth of his way. Sometimes the way of a child is different from the way of the parent. It can be slightly different or it can be radically different. If somebody has two children or three children or seven children, anybody here has seven children? No matter how many children you have, each child has a specific way to go, has giftedness and calling, divine calling. Of course, you want to instill the values of the Bible, Christian, solid Christian values in the child. But those values have to be embedded in a certain way, in that specific way, which is his or her specific personal way. It may not happen as often today, but historically we have made mistakes there. Because if you were born in a certain family, you knew there is one way for you to go. My way or the highway. And many people were frustrated throughout their lives. Doing something, walking away, they were not gifted for a way they had never been called for. This is why it's essential to look at this Challenge, because it's not easy to be a parent and, and see your child maybe trying to go a different way. So what if your child will take a different way than you imagine? And not about moral values. That's not what I'm speaking about here. Yes, I strongly believe moral values should be instilled from early on to all stages of development, same rule applies, put it in the mouth of their way, straighten it down. But the way may be different. And if it's different, how many times have we experienced sticking the sticks to the fence? How many times somebody said, I told you not to take that major. I told you not to go for that job. I told you not to move there. I told you not to buy that house. I told you not to buy that uh, car. I told you not to marry him or her. And then stick it in again and again and again and again. And then you have a situation where the stick is gone, long gone, but the dog, please understand it well, the dog is still what? Still barking. Right? And he, here, is, here is my struggle with this. When somebody is exasperated by their parents, if that parent also pretends to be a parent in Lord, then that person will feel like the Lord himself, God himself, is sticking the stick in to the fence. And when somebody rebels against their parents, they also rebel against God many times, and they leave the church because they perceive the church is nothing else but an extension of the same reality. So I don't need my parents. I don't need my church. In many cases, I don't need God himself. And, you know, children, we sometimes feel like going and leaving our parents. You have to know one thing. When in your teenage years you feel like going far, far away, far enough to never even hear about him, hear, hear about him or her, that will never happen. Because no matter where you go, you are taking them with you. Hey, they are in your DNA. And I've heard about children that kick their parents out of their homes. Never could kick them out from their conscience. So it's important to be able 
to handle this relationship appropriately. You know, a few weeks ago, some of you know, I went to the wedding of my brother, Ben. Ben is the next after me. We are four of us. And he left, left the church. He left his parents. He left the church. I cannot say anything regarding God because that's too personal. But I'm not surprised because out of the four of the brothers, he was the one that suffered the most, the most from sticking the stick to the fence by my father's mouth and my father's even hands. They even got in fist fight. And at one point he said, I'm going to kick everything and, and go. Now, here's the thing. He is a leader. And now there's a bunch of young people his age or a little younger or older that revolve around him. Same kind of experience, more or less. All young people that grew up in the church and they left or are on their way out. Angry. That's the problem. Angry. Somebody made us believe that those that leave, they will come back in their old age. And that's a myth. The majority of those that leave will never come back. And those that come back are those that have never left their parents. They may, left, may have left the church, but not their parents. Their parents have always been up there for them. Only very, very few from those that left because of the stick being stick through the fence will ever come back. Those are stats. And it's painful. I took some time to listen to these young people. See what kind of nourishment poisoned them. And two things that keep coming back again and again is this. Hypocrisy and injustice. Hypocrisy from parents and from church and by extension, they are blaming God for him being unjust or unjust. These are facts. And I can relate to them myself. You hear me speak about my father, and please understand something. I had a fairly decent relationship with my father until he passed away. Not so much my brethren, my brothers. But I could say, okay, I'm not going to speak about these realities ever, ever. Because that's part of honoring my father. I don't believe in that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because some of you are sitting in the pews here. Having gone through the same kind of experience... I've been through, and some of my brothers. And if you are in that situation, the stick may be long gone, but you may be still barking. And I'm speaking about myself as well. So we need healing. That's what we need, healing. On the other hand, there might be sitting people in the pew here that have been doing this. And they, or we, need repentance. That's all. Why? Because we all have been through experiences, but we want to take God's word seriously. This is how a prophecy outlines what should happen in this day and age among us. Malachi chapter 4. 
Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Verse 6, And he will turn the hearts of the, please tell me, who? Children? No, 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 no. Correct. The hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Yes, please never miss that whenever God gives you authority, the first responsibility is on you, even here. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Fathers, parents, are you turning your hearts to your children? Children, are you turning your hearts to your fathers?